I was born in a little village in Oxfordshire called Kiddington. It's about 12 miles from Oxford and about 26 miles from Stratford-on-Avon, in the midst of the Cotswolds. It's still only about 150 houses, but it was founded about 600 AD. There were deserted medieval villages all around, and, and I, at a very young age, I'm told, six, seven years old, I was out picking up pieces of medieval pottery and arrowheads and that sort of thing. So my interest in, in the world of museums and archaeology started when I was very young, but with no intention, I think, of pursuing it as a career. I always had this interest in, in things old, I, I, it would be fair to say. But um, it was a very difficult time to grow up in England. Uh, the, everybody was away at war. My school teachers were 80, 90 years old, this sort of thing. So I had this interest in things old, the old trackways, Roman villas, this sort of thing, which surrounds that part of the country. But I think my main interests or thoughts about pursuing what I was going to pursue as a way of life and earn a living was really in photography at that stage. I left school when I was 15 and went to work in a photographic processing establishment. And by the age of about 17, 18, I was in a commercial photography for Vogue. And, and in that part of England, we did all the Vogue stuff. And at 17 years old, I carried the master's bag, you know. And, uh, but graduated to things, and by the time I was about, I think, 18, 19, I had applied for a job in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford as assistant photographer. And so I had moved into a museum for the first time and met people in there who were conservators, who were training to be conservators. And uh, they seemed to think I'd, I was in the wrong profession as I devoted all my weekends to being out on archaeological sites digging with, with the professional archaeologists. And so I swapped departments when I was about mm. just 19 and a half, 20 years old. So quite often, um, because it was the Ashmolean Museum but with classical archaeology being the main, main interest for people there, the Romans, Greeks, that when a Saxon site was found on, on the gravels, uh, the Thames gravels are, are really quite close to Oxford, um, they would send me out on my bicycle with the spade and a, a box on the back, and out I would go and dig half a house, and then it would be bulldozed away, and I would drag it back, and somebody would or would not express interest in, in what I was doing. I had a, one of those marvelous strokes of luck which, which occur in people's careers, I think, in, in archaeology. I went out one day to dig. Uh, they uncovered some more houses. These houses were sunk into the Thames gravel, and they'd been burnt down round about 650. It's quite well documented. These two brothers went on a burning rage because they hadn't been paid by the then king of that part of England. When I was out there, there was this patch of uh, its sand, and then, of course, the infill for the houses or whatever is a dark color. And there was this piece that I could only describe as foot shape and about, uh, about two meters across. And I thought, that's kind of strange, all the earth is burnt and this sort of thing. And I thought it must be a kiln. I'd always been interested technically in pottery. I potted. And I thought, that's a kiln. And sure enough, you, there were impressions in clay of um, hazelnut sticks, which might have been the dome over it. So I wrote it in my notebook, went back, and said to the curator, I found a kiln. And he said, but no kilns have been found from the early 7th century in England. You know, impossible. And then Professor Jope was in the museum from um, Queen's University in Belfast in Ireland. And uh, he came out and looked at it and said, my God, you've got a kiln. And so I, you know, we wrote this paper up for medieval archaeology and I, I had my five seconds of, of fame and it sort of fired me up to this great and long-lasting interest in pots, of course. It was a different world, uh, conservation in those days. I, I mean, uh, a colleague, um, um, a long while ago said that conservation was a profession lately removed from the kitchen sink. 
And it was only just removed from the kitchen sink at that stage. Nobody knew very much. There were only two or three adhesives. This is before the advent of polyvinyl acetate and white glues and epoxies and resins. So we were still using bone glues of various makes and manufacture. So really it, it was a relatively primitive way of doing business. It, it concentrated more on the dexterity of, of, of things rather than the scientific approach, I would say. But I was very lucky being in a museum like that with the, a lot of, at that stage, relatively young people who'd come back from the war and, and, and had been away from the university and came back with a different view of life and they were prepared to, to help one. So if I wanted to go and talk to somebody about the Saxons or whatever, I could do that very easily in the museum. It was that wonderful period of, of interchange and social change as well. There, there were some truly wonderful people in the museum at that time um, who thought it rather strange, I think, that uh, somebody who was training to be a conservator had this interest in archaeology and was, by the age of 21, was relatively well read in, I think, English archaeology anyway. But with this interest in other parts of the world, which you acquire through being with the collection like that, I I suppose the, the person who was uh, a brush salesman, who uh, was trying very hard to, to get a job as a curator in the museum, which he eventually did. So he was spending most of his time on contract digging sites for the Ashmolean. His name was Ernest Montague Puckle. He was a tremendous help. He, he knew where I was coming from, as it were, and, and how Ernie used to take me out uh, with him and would explain about um, you know, plumb bobs and uh, surveying the site and this sort of thing. Humphrey Case, the uh, curator of the English collection, was a wonderful man. Um, the head at that time was uh, Vincent Rickard. His father, uh, I think, had not got enough money to put him through university, put his brother through, who was a naval surgeon and Vincent had uh, come to the Ashmolean Museum and his father had paid a vast amount of money in those days for him to be apprenticed there under Bill Young, who eventually uh, emigrated to America. So Vincent was made to take myself and two young ladies as apprenticeships without any payment. And he resented this enormously because his father had paid, I think it was like something like 2,000 pounds a year, which was a vast amount of money in the 30s. Um, and we were there for free, so whilst he realized he had to teach us, it was a very resentful man and with all kinds of chips on his shoulder about the world. I was paid and I, I've been racking my brains as I've sat here to try and remember how much I was paid. I was actually paid 25 shillings a week, um, 125 in, uh, in English pounds today. Um, my bus fare to Oxford, I would live 12 miles away, I think was about 12 shillings. So there was very little money and I think my mother allowed me to keep what was over after expenses. But it, yes, it was a fairly poverty stricken my parents moved there when my father retired from the army, but they'd grown up in villages within seven, eight miles of there. So in a way, the district was family. I only completed about four years of it. As I said, it was still flexible at that stage. And I thought it was time to move on. The director would have liked me to stay, but I, I, I thought I'd got to move out into a provincial museum somewhere. And I applied for the job of conservation officer at the city and county museum of Taunton in Somerset. It was based in a castle built by the, I think, brother-in-law of William, the conqueror, Bishop Otto. And the county council had just taken over the collection from the uh, County Historical Society and they were having a full-time curator and they needed a conservator uh, with some interest in archaeology. And uh, I applied and luckily got the job.
I know an old friend who became an old friend who had, had applied from the um, uh, British Museum, um, Heather, and she said, I only got the job because when the chairman of the board, and chairman of the county council, asked me what I did in my spare time, and I said I was a fly fisherman, and he said, dry fly or wet fly? And I said, dry, of course, sir. And she swore that was the only reason I got the job, because I was a dry fly fisherman. But in fact, I fish with wet flies most of the time. <laughs> They were wonderful collections. I mean, it was a very wide collection. I mean, natural history, geology, and everything. But they had the Mir Lake Village collection, uh, which is, has been re-excavated in recent years, which was a massive Iron Age uh, settlement in the bogs, in, in, in the Fenland, in, in Somerset. And these were composed of walkways, of oak trees. They actually made and built, raised uh, roadways. And uh, most of the organic material, of course, was preserved, the leather and bones and this sort of thing. Terrible for uh, some materials, but many were preserved. And um, St. George Grey, the previous curator to the museum, who was still alive, I moved into his house, actually, he used to tell me stories about uh, this, because uh, General Pitt Rivers, the father of English archaeology, had excavated with him on this site, so it was really the history of archaeology, and there I was with this fabulous collection of uh, Iron Age materials, and, um, and a lot of Bronze Age collections from down there, and of course, Roman settlements all over the place. So this absolutely fabulous collection, and there I am on my own, and um, the local expert, because the museum director was naturalist. So. Conservation was going through tremendous changes during this period that things we thought were great things to do, we knew weren't anymore. I mean, we no longer boiled um, Saxon ironwork in wax and then threw it into vats of sawdust to take the excess <laughs> wax off the outside because, of course, many of them had still got moisture uh, bound up in the molecules in the iron, and they just exploded when they went into the tanks of... Uh, Work. So all that had gone, um, but it was still a fairly primitive, I, I would say, the treatment of ob objects compared with now. I mean, we like to think we were on the cutting edge then, and um, there were new adhesives coming in, like PVAs and this sort of thing. And um, We'd got a handyman who'd been an undertaker and made coffins in those days, of course. They were made locally. So there was just myself and this guy who, who was a very good woodworker, actually. So he built the showcases, and I decided what color they would be and, and mounted the exhibits, and, uh, which was great fun. I mean, the director helped. And we had a wonderful man who was the only other professional member of staff who was a geologist, uh, quite a famous geologist, but with an interest in archaeology. But it was a small county museum, and the board outside said, we closed at four o'clock in the afternoon, or sunset, whichever came first. You know, it was those were sort of days. So I was in Taunton about four years, and then I moved to the um, Bristol City and County Museum, uh, where they wanted somebody to set up a, a new conservation department um, and a much larger collection and. Um, but again, no archaeologists on the staff, so I, I filled that niche again for rescue. Uh, I should hasten to add that most of the archaeology that I was involved with in those days was res of a rescue nature. You know, that they were pushing a road through somewhere and somebody had got to look at it that week. And, uh, so when I went to the Bristol City and County Museum, I, I was engaged in setting up a conservation department um, much larger collection, but a lot of really fun um, Bronze Age uh, archaeology and early Iron Age. I had two assistants um, that I, I was supposed to be teaching, but by then the Institute of Archaeology were training people in London, and most of the people we tried to keep for just a few years, give them a start anyway, and then they could apply and, and 
to get into the university in UCL, Institute of Archaeology in London. Up until that time, the Ashmolean Museum was the major museum, not just for the university, but for the county of o Oxfordshire, Oxfordshire County. But it had taken very little interest in the local archaeology and, uh, and certainly the folk life and all those sort of collections. So it was decided that uh, the city and county of Oxford Museum would be formed. Uh, unusual because it was a joint enterprise between the city council and the county council. Uh, so they formed a museum without a collection. Um, there was no collection. There was a director, wonderful lady, um, an archaeologist, um, and myself, no collection. And so as the director of Bristol said to me at the time, I know you've applied to, to uh, go to, back to Oxfordshire, it's your home county and great opportunity. So it was fun to go home, as it were, for me, and all the archaeological sites that I'd grown up with as a boy, I could go back and visit professionally, as it were. So that was the main reason. It was the excitement of going home, I suppose, and thumbing my nose at the uh, Ashmolean, you know, local boy makes good and all that stuff, you know. I spent the daytime um, with the archaeologist, Don Benson, um, for the first month or two looking at urgent things that had come up with the county council. They're straightening roads and want somebody to go out and look to see if there's a site. You know, most of the archaeological sites in England are on ordnance survey maps, you know, it will say it ancient tumuli or something. So we spent a lot of time sorting road works out and things like that. Visiting um, deserted medieval villages, deserted because of the plague, the bubonic plague and that sort of thing. And then in the evenings taking the Land Rover, the museum Land Rover, and going to the local pubs and drinking more than we ought and virtually saying to people, bring out your dead, you know, um, have you seen any old pots when you've been plowing or stone axes or this sort of thing? And it was just amazing the stuff we collected in about six months. A beautiful Bronze Age pot, nearly complete. It had been upturned and just the top had been plowed off. The rest was complete. Uh, just magic and lots of stone axes and flint arrowheads and. Um, and then one of these roads that uh, we'd gone to see the roadwork people about where they were going to straighten it turned into a, a Neolithic long barrow, which we spent four very happy years um, excavating and developed some of the newer techniques in archaeology. You know, we managed to build a, um, a, a pyramid out of Dexian handy angle that I could pull my rollic flex up to the top and photographed the whole thing as stone by stone it was taken down. So the, there were lots of firs there that were, was great fun. I was there for about five years and I guess by that stage I was, I wouldn't say I was embittered. I, I felt underprivileged by the lack of, uh, of any sort of um, I'd, I'd got a conservation certificate from the Museums Association, but I hadn't been to university. And going back into the milieu of Oxford and the people who I knew there, that's very, I'd got a chip on my shoulder, I, I guess. And my eminent director, who had two PhDs, uh, one in sex and archaeology, one in literature, uh, said to me, uh, you know the world is full of educated idiots, especially in Oxford. <laughs> And she said, you're not going to be happy until you've been to university. And I said, yeah, but it's out of the question. And she said, no, I've got two years leave of absence for you on full pay. And we're going to send you to do the three-year course at uh, the Institute of Archaeology at UCL, London University. But you're going to do it in two years because you're not going to do the practical. Um, so off I went, and it was in the 60s, great time, you know, to be in London, Carnaby Street and all that. And I did my two years at the Institute of Archaeology with um, people you know, like Charles Hett. Uh, Charles was an elderly student, like myself. There were 17-year-olds there on the course, and uh, I was relatively old, you know, 30-ish by that stage. And um, 
So finally I went to university and had a terrible job to keep up writing. Um, but it was great fun and I learned a lot, except my director said to me, you're going to be very dissatisfied with life in a provincial museum now. And I said, well, I've undertaken to come back for three years, you know, after I finished. And she said, yeah, but we're not going to hold you to it. And the next week I had a telephone call from, from a National Historic Site Service in Canada. About six months before, I'd seen an advertisement in uh, the Museum's Journal in, in England. I think it was by a firm called Janus Consulting out of Toronto. And it said, do you wish to work overseas in, in, in a museum? And we're looking for conservators. And I'd applied and sent off my CV. Nothing happened. And somebody from historic sites um, had looked at my CV and saw that I had carried out some uh, excavations on Viking sites in particular. And at that time, they were getting involved with the, uh, now we know as the Viking site at Lanso Meadows in um, Newfoundland. And they were looking for somebody who could go up and see what that was all about as, uh, as uh, Ingstad was excavating there, but nobody was quite happy with his techniques, you know, his 12-inch wide trenches and things. So they wanted somebody to set up a laboratory service across Canada for conservation, but as well go up and tell them whether this really was a Viking site. And they were getting two for the price of one, as the director told me. So I came to Kent six weeks later. I was here in Ottawa working for the uh, National Historic Site Service. They told me if it didn't turn out to be a Viking site, I would get a rowing boat and one oar to go back to England because they wouldn't need me. It was clearly an early settlement that was there were turf walls, which my, I knew nothing about Canadian archaeology, of course. But turf walls are very, um, you know, if you get turf walls, you think about the Vikings wherever they've been. At that stage, they'd found part of the longbow, which I didn't know enough that there weren't too many longbows about at that time. And, and they'd started doing some carbon-14 dates, and they were dating around 1,000. AD. So I'd, I thought it was clearly a Viking site, and then later they brought in the uh, director of the National Museum of uh, Sweden, who said, yeah, I think Mr. Arthur's right. We've got a Viking site here. And, uh, and historic sites took over the excavations at that stage. My director at that stage was John Rick, the, uh, the archaeologist at historic sites, and he was my boss. And uh, I was just a conservator at that stage. And uh, he, he hated flying. He would fly from somewhere to Montreal, get off the plane, and come by train to Ottawa rather than that. So I did the flying up and down and met with uh, Premier Smallwood, Joey Smallwood at the time, and got taken up and down with this plane and ate all his good ladies' cookies that she, fabulous cook. And, um, so it was great fun. It was a new world and great things going on with the Viking settlement there and, and the laboratories here. And I worked there from uh, 1970 till right at the beginning of 76. And um, then I was approached that they, there'd been moves in the government with the, uh, Mr. Peltier's decentralization and democratization policy for culture to move it out of Ottawa and uh, across the provinces. And the Canadian Conservation Institute was in the process of being set up then and for various administrative problems that it had got into, I was approached by Bernard Austry and asked if I would consider going across to be Director General at the um, Conservation Institute. And uh, I started there in 76. There were only about six conservators in Canada, and uh, I'd been to see the Director General of uh, National Parks, and I'd been given a little piece of paper by John Rick what I was to ask for. I was to ask for person years, which was a new terminology for me, and I'd been told to ask for a million and a half dollars and 18 person years to set up my department. That was when I was in 
uh, historic sites. So coming across uh, to the museum's corporation, as it was then, there was this whole business of uh, I'd come from a country where my budget was, if I was lucky, 10,000 a year, which paid people salaries as well. And I'd come to a country where they said they thought that the institute would end up with 100 people working there, you know, in a budget of a million and a half. So the biggest problem was you, you'd got all this money, you'd got a building being established by that stage, but there were no conservators in the country. So you were going through a very fast forward, trying to find conservators around the world, robbing all parts of the world. To such an extent, I was uh, banned from the British Museum. I wasn't allowed into the laboratories in the British Museum at that stage. For fear, I would hire people away to come to the frozen north as they saw it. You know? So we had conservators from Italy, from Switzerland, from England, Ireland, Germany. A great mass of people coming into the country. And that obviously wasn't in the long term the way to, to do things. It was a great way to get started. But we, uh, because of this decentralization policy, um, it was agreed that the corporation would fund the setting up of the MA program at Queen's University in Kingston. So we're able to start a conservation course there. And that was Ian Hodkinson founded it, a Scot uh, from Edinburgh. And so that was great fun being in the midst of that incredible expansion. But the, the biggest problem was uh, um, bringing all these people into Canada in one go. Um, and that was difficult because the people who wanted to emigrate from their, their countries um, to come to Canada all stayed. The people who said, well, I'll go and see what it's like, they all went back. It's quite interesting. They split the group, splits like that. But many of the people stayed on, and, uh, and today I think uh, I hired Cliff McCauley away from Edinburgh from the National Research Laboratory. And in fact, on Wednesday of this week, 30th of um, November 2005, Cliff is going to retire. And I hired him away as this very young man from Scotland. But now we have mass of young Canadians as conservatives. I was at CCI until um, oh, 81, and um, 1981, um, so I moved from the Conservation Institute to um, the Museum of Man as it was then, and Bill Taylor was here then of course, and there were just the moves were starting then, to thinking about a new national museum. Uh, I was rather more interested, I thought, finally I can go back to conservation because I should have said since I'd been in Canada, I'd not treated an artifact. Um, so I talked with Bill about this and he said, well, the guys up in the north, you know, need some help, the problems of thawing out sites to excavate, and I'd got lots of ideas about that. And then all of a sudden the buildings were flooded, that their collections were in the ethnographic and archaeological collections. And my early years in photography came back to help me out. So I documented all the terrible things that were happening to the collection and that wonderful gallery with all the native artifacts. Sometimes there was three quarters of an inch of ice on the walls and the, it was the Ice Age gallery, yes indeed. So I documented all this um, and produced this horror story book, I suppose. And um, everybody had gone off one weekend and I was left to meet the press with this book. And um, Bill always said it really fired up the thoughts of, with the politicians about um, finding the money to build the new museum. I mean, it had as much, though, to do with the unemployment in the building trades all sorts of political reasons as well. But I, I was, looking back in retrospect, I was very happy to have had a hand in the creation, as it were, at that stage. I was lucky because I was able to document the things myself. I, I was a conservator, or I'd been a conservator. I'd, been, I'd become, over the years, as director general and whatnot, and working 
for historic sites. I'd become, I guess, less politically naive. I, I'd learned how the system worked and what you needed to do to prod it along, to, to get money and that sort of thing. So it seemed to me, and, and Bill was a great character, uh, Bill Taylor, I was very, very fond of him. Um, there seemed to be an opportunity to explain to the political world, as it were, how sad it was, the conditions that the collection was being stored under, and that if something wasn't done soon, like in the next few years, part of the collection was going to disappear, and the press picked this up from using our photographs and this sort of thing. And um, then in talking with Bill, uh, I discovered it wasn't really known what the size of the collection was. So for about 18 months, two years, I conducted this survey with the help of my, my colleagues at the Canadian Conservation Institute. A survey, not item by item, but in, you know, drawer by drawer, as it were, in archaeology, the state of the collection. And we ended up with a total, I think, of somewhere around about four million artifacts at that stage. But we got a, a really good idea of what state it was in and, and what we needed to do. And that, of course, formed the basis for the design and building of these laboratories here, which I, I did the design work for, and then liaise with the architects and engineers. So that, those were great times. I, I came as, uh, like, uh, George MacDonald, and I discussed, because George was here then, of course, as a senior scientist. Um, so I was senior scientist conservation, George was senior scientist uh, archaeology. And I had a wandering brief, as it were. I was out at Bell's Corners with the archaeologists, thank God, uh, um, setting out to make myself useful. And as I optimistically thought to return to my roots, of uh, conservation and, and learn much more about uh, Canada's archaeology and, uh, and a tremendous group of people, the archaeologists out there at that time. And some I'd met earlier uh, through historic sites and uh, Bob McGee I'd met in Newfoundland, of course, at, the, at our Viking site when he was at Memorial. So I thought I was coming home and I was going to go out in the field, you know, and see the musk ox and all this sort of thing. And then the money seemed to be available to design and build this, uh, this new museum. So I became wrapped up in that. Very strangely, because um, the uh, director of uh, collections and research at that time, Michael, went off to head up the museum program. And I became acting director of collections and research in the museum, which was a big jump in, in many ways, but I hoped I'd acquired enough tact over all the, those years that the archeologists and historians didn't feel too badly about me being their director at that, um, that time. So that was really a fun time, going back, as it were, to my roots, working with archeologists, trying to get them bigger budgets. Then the museum, it, it, it became pretty clear that, um, that our, our eyes were bigger than our stomachs, as it were, as my mother used to say, um, that there wasn't going to be enough money to do all the things that the museum wanted to do. And George MacDonald, who was director at that time, said I was one of the few people in the museum who was interested in the business world. Um, would I like to become the first director of development in the museum and take over fundraising and I thought that would be kind of fun as long as I could hire somebody who really did know about fundraising. Um, so I spent my last two or three years in the government raising money for the government which is uh, not totally a fun enterprise. Yeah. I think we did really quite well only because I was able to hire a, a really a quite brilliant uh, lady, Paula Fairweather, who came, who'd been responsible for raising millions at Expo and things all across the country. And a very unusual lady with a degree in fine arts as well as in business, um, macroeconomics. And, uh, and Paula knew all about fundraising, so uh, she said I was useful to take along after she'd met people in business and 
and she needed somebody to uh, go out and then tell the story of museums, which I hope by that stage I could do. So I guess we, in total, we raised about $3 million in that two years uh, because we were getting to the sad stage. I think there wasn't actually enough money to pay for the governor general to come down in her carriage to open the museum. So we were desperately looking around for ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 for the opening, you know. I took early retirement. It was the time when packages were being offered all around. I, I think at that stage I was about 58, 59. And I'd been working since I was 15 years old. And uh, the lady with whom I was living at that time said, well, you really ought to stop and go and do all the things you want to do in your, with your solar greenhouse and fishing and fly fishing. And so I said, yes, that's really great. And uh, I did that for six months and became bored to death, of course. <laughs> I mean, it was great fun going off for a weekend to catch trout or, or frighten them to death. It was quite different to do it full time. And then people suggested, well, I could really do things with conservation. And uh, so I started doing one or two projects with colleagues who'd retired. And, um, and I'd continued my interest in ceramics. Um, I'd, I'd been doing other things as well as work for the federal government. I'd been chairman of the International Council of Museums Committee for Conservation and then chairman of the Advisory Council of ICOM. So I'd had the opportunity to travel around the world a lot into, into some quite dangerous places where I shouldn't have gone sometimes. But always looking at people's pottery around the world and and coming to the conclusion that coarse pottery was coarse pottery wherever you were in the world. And um, form really, truly does follow function. Um, and I'd always had this lifelong interest, I suppose, not just of as conservation as a means of putting things back together, but a, a means of uh, explaining to the public and to oneself, of course, and, and other people, what you could learn from the, the from pottery, from potsherds, and what might be embedded into them. Sometimes fingerprints that were on the outside of them. What conclusions you could come to about the age of the person who'd made the pot. And in a way, I suppose I was searching to get back there with the people who made the pots. And because by this stage, I would spent nearly 40 years, 35, 40 years, um, looking at pots around the world and, and conserving them for the early part of my life. It was great fun, finally, not to be involved with five-year budget plans, and which never happened, of course, in the government. Um, finally, to say, well, yes, I will actually come and restore your pot, and I will write down for you what I've done. I don't want to know anything about the structure or the problems that you've got funding the museum anymore. Um, so I guess then people knew I was back in the conservation world, uh, and so I was asked to do things overseas where I'd traveled and, and places like Kuwait and work with the Islamic Museum there and work in Canada, in Newfoundland, returning um, on later sites, 16th, 17th century sites, and, uh, and then going back to places like New Brunswick with Pat Allen at the uh, Provincial Service and restoring some of their early pottery and, and, and then working for the Mi'kmaq people themselves to, as the collection is turned over to them, working with their pots and uh, having that great moment of taking a pot back, you know, that had been five, six hundred shards and, and meeting with the elders. And, uh, at, very shyly at first on both sides, I, I must say, but then after six or seven visits feeling that you were one of the one of the group there and having this opportunity to see them start their museum. Great fun. I, I think you've got to love what you do. Uh, that's, I guess people don't totally understand that nowadays, sadly. You've really got to, to love what you do. You've got to love the pots. And you have, I think the thing that, that really makes me, if I am successful at all after all these 50 years of sticking pots, is I've seen a lot of pots. I, I must have seen hundreds of thousands of pots. 
sometimes just pot shirts that I've collected myself. And it's very difficult because this is a question one doesn't think about as a conservator. I think it's this seeing so many pots that when you pick up a shirt in your hand, you don't see it as a small fragment of the pot. It is a small fragment, but you automatically start projecting the image, what shape this could have been. Was it a big pot? Was it a cooking pot? Was it something else? Was it a ceremonial pot? You can tell by the wear, the way it's fired, and this sort of thing. So all those things are going on, I suppose, subconsciously, that uh, when, you, when you look at a pot. And I, I don't know how this happens. You develop some sort of innate idea of what you start thinking about the shape business. Uh, the restoration of pots is really all about shapes. If you take for granted that you have the ability to stick the pieces together, fill in the gaps and this sort of thing, you need to develop this eye for what shape the pot was. And I think this comes out of a, a number of things. It comes out of um, the material that the pot's made of, that the possibilities with that clay, I mean, with, with primitive clays, uh, it's very difficult to make a very large pot but because it collapses as, as you're making it. What it was used for, whether it was a ceremonial, a storage pot, a cooking pot, and you can tell these things by looking at the surface, seeing whether it was burnt. You need to have some idea in your mind without touching the pot, or this is just looking at it is what I'm talking about is what the firing temperatures might have been, so you know whether the sherd before you touch it is, is handleable or not. I mean, some sherds that are excavated, the archaeologist has brought in carefully, but you probably shouldn't touch it. It's that fragile, that friable. So you're thinking about all those things when you look at a part, and um, you're looking at it and, and debating in your mind whether this pot actually needs impregnating, that sort of thing, before you even handle it. This, for most of us, is a very last resort because you really don't want to do anything to the pottery that you can possibly avoid doing uh, uh, because somebody in 50 years' time is going to come back and have developed uh, new systems of analyzing the pot shirts, and you don't want it to be covered with, with some modern resin that's going to interfere with that. So you're intent on doing as little as possible, um, but restoring the pot to its shape. So all those things are going through your mind, and you're looking at the angles of the curve of a pot. Um, Jigsaws are a problem for me, jigsaw puzzles. I, I've never been very successful at it. But I did a pot about five years ago for, for a lady. It was a 15th century pot from the Caribbean. And it was in about, I think it was 825 pieces, she said. And I put them out on the dining room table rather than in my laboratory because she wanted to come up and potter in and out and look at what I was doing. And I realized that I spread them out and I do what all archaeologists do, you know, rims here, bases here, and middle bits in the middle of the table. Um, but that I've acquired, or I always had the ability to think, oh, there's a piece that shape, and be able to reach out and pick up that piece of pot. And I'm not sure, and I've never been sure, whether this is something you're born with. But I think all these uh, multitude of things that, that you acquire over the years uh, enable you to do that. I, a long while ago, had a young lady come to work for me who was thrown out of the Institute of Archaeology. She'd been brought up in convent schools and ran a little wild when she went to London. And uh, they asked if I would take her on because she seemed so good at doing things. And uh, I got the flu, I think, and in the midst of an ex exhibition of medieval pots, and there were seven pots to go. And I was off sick for two weeks, and I came back, and these pots were, were magic. Uh, I looked at these pots, and I couldn't do them that well. And this lady had had about 18 months. So it can't just be looking at pots. I think there are some people you would like to restore their pots. For me, because I've been doing this, this so long, I usually get pots that are in many pieces, hundreds of pieces. 
So I tend to forget about the technology, about the adhesives I'm using and this sort of thing. And I'm concentrating totally to the exclusion of everything else for that month when I'm doing the pot, day and night, I'm just thinking about that pot. I'm thinking about the shape of the pot, why it was made like that, what was the sort of person who made it, what were their difficulties, because I've looked at the material that the pot's made of, and I'm thinking about the difficulties of the person who made the pot and how they did it. and. Uh, some of the very beautiful pots, I'm thinking, we can't reproduce this now with all our technology, you know, that they, they had this great ability, this great craft ability to create these things. So I've got to the stage happily in my life where I can forget about the technology and, and all the rest and concentrate on the, the function of the pot, the beauty of the pot. Um, and for me, just the sheer joy of actually being allowed to handle it, uh, it's a great privilege.